Uh, I want to thank the folks at TaxLayer for uh, inviting the IRS. I would especially appreciate you guys clapping because the IRS doesn't get a whole lot of that. It's, uh, yeah. I remember my first day on the job, the lady doing the orientation with me says, you're going to come to understand why when you go to a restaurant and you're a group of IRS employees, you don't tell them you're from the IRS. I'm like, what are you talking about? Now I get it. Um, and I, and as, I, I especially want to thank TaxLayer. I was thinking about it. I don't know when this company was founded, uh, but they could have just as easily named it IRS Slayer. And so, you know, thank you. That's, yeah. Um, let me get my little clicker here. So that's, uh, that's me. I, um, I'm an IRS special agent. We all like to refer to ourselves as special agents. I've, uh, believe it or not, I've been a special agent for 30 years next month. Um, we have a mandatory retirement age of 57, so they're actually going to escort me out the door in a couple of years. Uh, but when they do, who knows? I may be a tax slayer customer. All right. It's, might be a nice retirement job. Is it, is it really that hard? I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of on the other side of it, I guess. Not with uh, tax slayer software, it's not that hard. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I've, uh, I mentioned 30 years. I've, I've, uh, I've been in quite a few places. I, I do have to correct Richard. I'm uh, actually from New England, but I, um, some of you may pick up on an accent. I am not a native New Englander. I'm a native Texan. Um, I, uh, I made the mis well, I guess it was a great mistake, but I married a New England girl 25 years ago, so that was... That was it. I'm still in New England. Um, but I've, I've, my, my career has taken me around. I've, 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 done the, I've been a special agent in various leadership positions in uh, Texas, New England, New Jersey, and uh, of course headquarters. We all have to go through headquarters in DC. Um, so my, my job is, oh yeah. Well, that's not really my job, but that's our mission. And I always like to talk a little bit about the mission. Um, so the IRS is, is a pretty big organization. You know, we've got 80,000 employees. That includes, you know, some seasonal folks. When I started in 1987, we had 120,000 employees. So we're, a lot, we're smaller now, but of course, we're, we're more, we like to think we're more efficient. Um, but a very small part of the IRS is the Criminal Investigation Division. And I always like to ask the question, and, um, before I came here today, how many of you had ever heard of IRS Criminal Investigation? All right, more, more than half, which I would expect from this crowd. I've talked to groups of college students, you know, during recruiting. I've, I've talked to, to various groups. Sometimes, you know, a group half this size, I may see two or three hands who are aware, have ever even heard of IRS criminal investigation. I have to admit, until I applied for the job in 1987, I'd never heard of it either. Uh, and the, the reason I'm telling you all this is, is our mission is you know, we don't audit, we don't collect, we don't assess tax. Some of us, including myself, don't really even like taxes. I was not an accounting major. I don't like accounting. You know, we are law enforcement. Our job is to put the folks who jeopardize our tax system in jail and get it publicized. So the fact that most of you have heard of IRS criminal investigation, we're doing something right, and I assume all of you know you can go to prison for cheating on your taxes, for defrauding the IRS, for jeopardizing our tax system. I, I think everybody should know that. So that's what criminal investigation does. Um, 
Now, as far as my specific unit, I think I'm pushing the, oh, yeah, I got it. Did that work or? You, you work that magic, huh? All right. Then I guess we'll just do that thing. Yeah. All right, these are, uh, in the Office of Refund Crimes, these are our major investigative areas. Um, return preparer program, that is the, pretty much the identification and investigation of fraudulent return preparers. I know there's no fraudulent return preparers in here. None of you will ever be a fraudulent return preparer. But if an IRS special agent ever shows up at your door, it's not gonna be a good day. Uh, I'll just, unless they're there to talk to you about someone else, which, which happens. Um, some of these other areas, uh, questionable refund program that typically that's ID theft now, and you can see ID theft and cyber crimes. Um, I'll get into some of the ID theft uh, situations, but certainly that's something nowadays that's, that's exploded. Um, I, I hope all of you are taking uh, uh, actions to develop and put a security plan in, in, in place for your, your information. But I'll, I'll talk to that a little bit. Um, I, I, I do wanna mention that we have um, IRS, I mentioned we're a small unit within the IRS. We do have agents in every state. Um, anybody here from Vermont? I didn't think so, that's, that's a long ways. Uh, we're down to one special agent in Vermont, um, which, is, which is not good. We're, we, we're not gonna let that guy go anywhere because we, we can't have no agents. Um, now, in, in criminal investigation, th th these are my primary program areas, our kind of interest in investigations. Now, we also do the, you know, the, the regular tax evasion investigations, fair to file investigations, uh, we do money laundering investigations, uh, you know, narcotics-related investigations, uh, terrorism investigations. You know, any, anytime there's, there's criminal activity at a federal level where somebody has to go in and trace the money, that's, we do a lot of that uh, because that's, cause, you know, we all have the backgrounds to, to, to understand that stuff and actually like doing it. You know, you go to a DEA agent and give them bank records to analyze, forget about it, because they just don't care about that stuff. But IRS agents, we, we like that stuff. Um, but obviously, we're gonna focus on the return preparer program today. Um, there you go. So return preparer fraud, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read this to you, and I, I think um, obviously the, the folks in this crowd will, will pretty much understand what we're talking about there. Um, a, a lot of what we see on a, on a fraudulent return prepare is um, EITC fraud, you know, maximizing the EITC for a customer, for all their customers, over and over again. Um, other refundable credits in addition to the EITC. Um, you know, itemized deductions, clearly, you know, you, you, you show me a fraudulent Schedule A and it's probably gonna have charitable con contributions that never happened or unreimbursed business expenses. You know, for a W-2 wage earner, you know, they, they really shouldn't have much, if anything. And, um, you know, overstated medical deductions. Those are the kind of things we see. And, you know, the, 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 the important thing to, to note here is this, this bottom part. Now, you all have clients. We, we call them taxpayers. Now, if, we, if there's a fraudulent return preparer out there and they're preparing fraudulent returns for most, if not all of their clients, do most of their clients know what's happening? I'd say most don't really understand, but a lot of them do. And you're getting them, not you, the fraudulent return preparer is, is getting them a nice big refund. So they're appreciative of that. Now, 
is the IRS gonna go after those individual clients or taxpayers? No, because typically, you know, their return is, is let's say the return preparer puts an extra five grand of deductions on there, if the additional loss to the government's, let's say a couple of thousand bucks. That, that, that doesn't rise to the level of a criminal prosecution. You know, we've got, like I said, you know, we've got less than 2,000 agents in the country. You know, we can only do so much. However, if we have a return preparer who is fraudulently generating $2,000 in false claims for 400 clients every year, year after year, what's 2,000 times 400? I think it's $800,000. Um, so is that gonna rise to a criminal level? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's the focus of this particular program area, not the taxpayers, but the actual return preparers themselves. And at the end of this, I'll go through some actual uh, recent uh, prosecutions. Those are always fun. Um, by the way, they gave me an hour and 10 minutes for this presentation. There's no way. So, you know, Richard, don't worry about your, you know, I, I'm 40, 45 minutes to tops. But I will say, you know, I'll take, I'll take questions if you guys have any questions, and I'll hang around during the break um, if anybody has any questions they don't want to ask in front of the rest of the group. And I promise I, don't, I, I won't take your name or anything. Um, I, I was going to comment, you know, usually the only time I get wired up like this is, is when we're wiring up an undercover agent, but uh, some uh, law enforcement humor there. Okay, um, so how does CI get our investigations, our return preparer investigations? How do we find out about potentially fraudulent return preparers? Well, we, uh, we refer to the first method there as scheme development. You're all familiar with when I started, actually started my career at an IRS service center in Andover, Massachusetts. Now we call them campuses. But at eight of our campuses, CI has scheme development centers. And they're, they're a group, uh, in, at each of these eight SDCs, there's a group of very, very well-trained investigative analysts. And, and what they do is you know, our, our system with all the tax data is called IDRS, and they have all these, you know, various programs and algorithms to identify, you know, based upon patterns year after year of, of return preparers who we think might be up to no good. Um, now, does that mean they are? I'd say most of the schemes come to nothing, but, you know, if, 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 if they identify, you know, a thousand schemes a year, you know, maybe a hundred of those will end up being a criminal investigation. Uh, so, so that's something they do. And of course, I can't really tell you what they're looking for, because um, that wouldn't be fair. Um, but I will, I will throw this out to you. Um, so let's say there's a return preparer and their refund rate, the percentage of their returns that get refunds, let's say it's at 75%. Does that sound out of whack? I think it may depend on where they're at, you know, what their clientele is, the, the typical demographic. You know, if it's in a lower income area, that, that may not be out of whack at all. What if it's 90%? Well, again, that start wow, 90%, 90% of their taxpayers come in and get a refund? What if it's 99%? Okay, we see it. We see it all the time. We see preparers who every, virtually every one of the people who walk through their door get a refund. Now, are they up to no good? We can't really say yes, but I can guarantee you at some point they're going to be schemed and looked into by our IAs. So what am I telling you folks? Well, I'll, let, I'll leave that up to you. But, but that's, just, that's just one thing that 
out of probably dozens of criteria that we would look at to help identify someone who we think may be doing fraudulent tax returns. Um, taxpayers and informants. That, that's another big source. Um, I, I would almost say that's where some of you may come in. Um, you know, like, like I said, we, we are law enforcement. We depend on leads, snitches, rats, whatever you want to call them. We call them informants. If, if you folks are aware of a return preparer down the street and you've run across a lot of their clients from past years or current years and the clients are telling you stories about what they're doing, Call CI, because we may not know about it. Right? I'd say we probably don't know about it. Um, so that, that's another source of our cases. You know, can, can people see that as trying to get rid of the competition? Well, I, I hope they wouldn't see it that way, um, be, because I don't think anybody's just going to call the IRS and make up stuff against a, you know, a competitor. But, but if you know something, you know, it's, it's like what you see in the airports. Airports. If you see something, say something. Because, you know, we're all taxpayers. You know, the, uh, the, the, the government spent money for me to fly down here. You know, somebody's got to raise the money. Um, you know, taxpayers themselves. It's not unusual for um, taxpayers to, to go into a return preparer and, and the return preparer is trying to do something on their returns, you know, to, to get them a bigger refund. And they're like, man, this is just wrong. And they'll call the IRS. Uh, now, of course, they only know about that one instance, but we may, you know, if we get calls from multiple taxpayers over, you know, a one year filing period, that may result in a scheme development. Um, collaboration with IRS business units. You, you, you all, I'm sure you're all familiar with RPO, the Return Prepare Office. They're the folks who issue the, the P-10s um, and, and a lot of other stuff. But they, in, anytime um, there's a complaint against a return preparer by anyone, it goes to them usually. We, we, CI doesn't see a lot of those. So then they will kind of evaluate it and get it over to CI for us to take a look at. Um, the, 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 the functions that, that go out and do audits, you know, SBSE, the revenue agents, and then, you know, the, the, the ones who collect, the revenue officers also, typically with SBSE. Um, if, if they see some sort of fraudulent behavior out there during an audit or during a collection activity, they will put together what's called a fraud referral, and they'll get that over to CI. So those are all ways that we can, um, you know, kind of find out about potentially fraudulent return preparers. Okay, these are just some of the, uh, I, I know this, this won't mean too much to you folks, but these are the actual criminal statutes that, that we use when we prosecute return preparers. Uh, the top one is by far the most common. It's uh, 72062, which is aiding or assisting in the preparation of a false return. Um, it's, it's really not that hard to prove. In, in, in one respect, in another respect, it's very difficult. Any, any criminal statute, we have to show intent. We have to show willfulness. We have to show they're doing this on purpose. And, you know, every return prepare case I've ever seen, the first, you know, we'll, we'll go out and we'll talk to them. Next thing you know, we get a call from a defense attorney and the defense attorney says, Always, always. Well, they're just, they're just doing the returns based on what a taxpayer gives them. I mean, that is the defense. And oftentimes it's a good defense. But then it's up to CI to say, no, that's, that's not what happened here. You know, so during the course of our investigations, we're going to be going out and interviewing a lot of those taxpayers that you did a return for. And if we get 15, 20, 25 of them, who are willing to come into court and tell a different story, 
than, than what the return preparer told us, there's a good chance there's going to be a, a conviction there. And I'll, I'll get into some of our statistics later. Um, most of these are five-year felonies. Uh, very few return preparers who are um, convicted will, will see five years in, in jail. There's probably going to be a you know, big restitution payment, fines and penalties. Um, good luck ever getting another Ethan or, or P-10, but uh, that's probably going to be the least of your worries. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not scaring you folks too much, am I? Because that's not my intent here, because I know everybody in here is on the up and up. They do, you know, they do good returns, occasional mistakes. You make all the mistakes you want. Mistakes are not criminal. You know, that's, that's a civil thing. Um, don't, don't make sure you understand. We don't put folks in jail for making mistakes. That's why we have to show a very significant pattern of wrongdoing. Okay. Um, now, I, I've, I've talked some about criminal investigations. Uh, that's kind of our core. That's what we do. That's what most of our agents spend their time doing. But we also, we do stuff like this. Uh, you know, we, we get out and do outreach. You know, for a, a bigger group like this, they're probably going to bring in some mo from headquarters like me um, who thinks they really know what they're talking about. Uh, but, you know, we have, we have field offices in every state all over, you know, numerous PODs, and a lot of times those agents will go out and talk to smaller groups and, and pretty much give you the same spiel I'm, I'm giving right now. Um, so that's kind of the, the outreach and, and education. Uh, another program we have is, is this only, this started three or four years ago. It's called the Knock and Talk Visit Program. Um, so we'll, we'll partner up with, a, with an SBSE revenue agent and, and we'll go out and do a, an educational visit with return preparers. And we'll, now these aren't just, this is not a random thing. This is, you know, we'll go out and talk to these folks because we've seen some stuff that, that we're a little concerned about. Now, if we really felt it was criminal, uh, we wouldn't be going out and talking to the folks with a revenue agent. Um, so, so it's something that doesn't rise to the level of criminal, but it's something that we're concerned about that we want to, we, you know, we want to educate the return preparer and make sure they understand that it's probably something they should stop doing. Um, we, we go out with revenue agents, because, you know, they're, they're the professional accountants, that they can kind of explain to the return preparer, you know, a little bit more detail than, than what the special agent can. Um, it says they're identified by a scoring system. It, it, it's random in that we score all return preparers, and if, if the score reaches a certain level, then it, it may result in a knock and talk. We, we don't do a whole lot of these yet uh, around the country. We, we hope to start doing more of them because I think it's a good, um, you know, it's a good preemptive way to, to kind of make sure folks understand our concerns. Uh, field office special agent visits, those are, those are very similar. If, if a field office, you know, th they may have some concerns about a return preparer, so a couple of agents will just go out and talk to that return preparer. Again, it's not a criminal investigation. They'll, they will make that very clear to the return preparer. Uh, media publicity, you know, I'll, I'll be going over some, some of that at the end. Um, but again, that's, that's kind of what we do. You know, we can only prosecute so many people, so when we do, we really want to get it publicized as much as possible. Uh, YouTube videos, there's actually, just this year, we produced a couple of YouTube videos in my shop. Um, I think they're pretty good, but one's on, a, one's on setting up a, a, the, the importance of having a, a, you know, a, a, a security plan in, in your uh, business for a return prepare, and also, um, if you've been breached, if you've been compromised, what do you do next? So those are on YouTube right now if you want to, well, not right now, but I know your phones are off, right? Um, but they're out there. And th this knock and talk program, we can actually assess the success of it by comparing that preparer's returns, prior year's returns to the returns the year after that we went out. 
you know, after, after we had visited them. And there's a, there's a pretty uh, distinct um, return on our investment. We'll just we'll put it that way. Um, all right. Okay, the statistics. I, I, I wish somewhere on this slide there was a, uh, you know how you see in thousands or in millions? Those are the numbers, you know. During each of those years, that's how many investigations CI initiated on return preparers. Um, how, many, how many times we recommended prosecution. How many convictions. Um, now I, want, I want to just point out the conviction rate. For someone that we recommend a prosecution of, that is the percentage that end up being convicted either by pleading guilty or going, to, or going to trial and being found guilty. So as you can see, we don't frivolously take things um, to the end there. You know, if, if someone's been indicted, they're, or if, if we recommend prosecution, they're probably going to be convicted. Because, you know, the worst thing that can happen to us is to go to trial and lose. Because that media, yeah, that's, that's going to get just as much media as a conviction. Well, that's not good. That's not good media. So we don't. We really don't want that to, to happen. Um, you, you can't add up these numbers because our investigations can take 18 to 24 months or even longer. So something in, initiated in 14, you know, it may not. There may not be a cross recommendation until 16, and you know, they may not be sentenced until FY18. So that's why those numbers don't, don't add up. But um, as far as investigations initiated, what, what do you guys think of those numbers? Would, would you have thought it would be higher? I certainly wish it was higher. Um, but, but again, these return prepare investigations, it, it's only about 15 to 20 percent of what we do in CI. You know, the rest of it is that other stuff I mentioned. And, you know, there's only so many of us. Um, there, were, there were a lot more 10 years ago than there are now. And, you know, it, it, it's unfortunate, and, and, and maybe it's, maybe you guys look at those numbers and think, wow, great, you know, what are my chances here? Um, but I, I think as a taxpayer, you might look at those numbers and say, wow, we, we really, gee, I know of 305 bad preparers just in my city. Uh, you know, I, so, uh, I don't know, well, we, we do what we can. Um, and you'll see the average months to serve, that, that's actual you know, months in prison and under the federal system, there's no such thing as uh, parole or anything. You have to serve 90% plus of your sentence. So, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I don't want to go to jail for 26 months. My wife might like me to go to jail for 12. <laughs> um, let's see. All right, I covered all of that. All right, EFIN numbers. You, you should all know what an EFIN is. Um, you know, we, we really don't have much to do with the EFIN program in CI, but if, if um, you know, we are part of the process to revoke EFINs. And I, I think, you know, something to be aware of is, you know, to, to prosecute and convict a return preparer, it takes beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a really high bar. It's hard to achieve. That's why I'd say at least half the people that we ever initiate investigation on don't ever get prosecuted because we just, we don't think it's strong enough to take all the way. 
But I, I can virtually guarantee you, if we initiate an investigation on, on a return preparer, you're gonna lose your ethan. Because the bar is much lower. It's preponderance of the evidence. Um, so we do get involved in the, in the ethan revocation process. Uh, we, we have to, uh, all, all of the ethan revocations have to be vetted through us. And that's how many there are a year, or, or there were. And interesting thing about Ethan revocations is once you've been revoked, it's really hard to get your Ethan back. Um, what we see is a lot of fraud, you know, a lot of fraudulent activity where people are, you know, someone's using other someone else's Ethans. They're, um, you know, they're just they're ghost preparers. They don't identify themselves on returns. They. They steal Ethan's, you know, if so, you know, if, if someone's a fraudulent return preparer, they're probably not going to be too concerned about stealing someone's Ethan and using it. Um, but you, you certainly want to avoid any activity that would re result in a suspended or revoked Ethan. Okay, warning signs of potential fraud. Um, the, the, the top one there, you know, very much, you know, common sense. Again, these are, th these are the kind of things that we might be looking at with scheme development. You know, if you have a taxpayer who has a, you know, W-2 income of $30,000, and we see a Schedule A for $20,000 on their, on their return, you know, that just, it doesn't add up. Is it possible? Yeah, I guess, but it just, it's, it's not probable, that's for sure. Um, so, you know, that would indicate a fraudulent Schedule A scheme. Uh, claiming false dependence. You know, there's preparers who, you know, if they're doing a lot of EITC returns, and I guess for EITC you can only use so many dependents. I'm, I'm not sure how that works. Uh, but if someone has more than those, the return preparer will just sock away that dependent and use it for someone else. And, you know, that's, that adds up. One of the cases we'll mention actually had that, that scheme. Don't, I'm not, don't do that. Don't, don't, if you never thought of doing that, don't do it. Um, certainly the, um, I mentioned the, the stuff we see on Schedule A's over and over again. Um, claiming tax credits based on false income expenses. You know, my, my first case as an agent and this was, this was 1988, was a kid in prison buying names and social numbers from his fellow inmates for two packs of cigarettes and doing fraudulent returns, maximizing EITC. And you know what, it worked. Um, it's, it's still happening. So, you know, nowadays we'll see you know, return preparers throw on a, a fraudulent Schedule C. We, we, we see the same thing over and over again. Um, some of them just use the same, you know, nail technician, hair braiding, whatever, uh, just to get, get into that EITC sweet spot. And then, of course, you know, fraudulent expenses on a Schedule C to offset income. Okay, Whew. that's pretty much the end of my, my uh, scared straight speech for return preparers. <laughs> we'll, we'll go over some actual cases at the end, but you know, I, th those are, that all happened, so. Um, so. So now, oversight of emerging threats. Uh, the, the top one there, data breaches, it's, it's a big problem now. Uh, over the last year, 18 months, uh, I'll, I'll explain why. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but you know, five to seven years ago, if, if you had someone, you know, not a return preparer, but a fraudster, we call them typically, who wanted to do a false, you know, who wanted to steal IDs and prepare fraudulent tax returns and get, you know, fraudulent refunds from the IRS, all they really needed was a name and a social number. And 
we would stop most of those, um, but you know, these, it's a numbers game. So, you know, if, if they do 10 and one goes through and it's a $3,000 refund, that's not a bad day's work, right? Um, the IRS in the last five years, I, I can proudly say, it's not really CI, it's, it's, a, it's other functions within IRS, we have improved immensely in our filtering process. Folks, you know, instead of one out of 10 going through, it's, it's like one out of a thousand would slip through our filters if it's just a name and a social number. Well, you know, the fraudsters, they're, they're smart and they're, they're, they're constantly adapting. You know, they, they, they're constantly evolving. And so now they know in order to beat the IRS, they need what we call high consistency information, um, which typically means a tax return, either a prior year tax return or a current year tax return that's being prepared, or, or W-2s, they're considered high consistency tax information also. So they need information that good in order to beat the IRS. What is the best source of tax information other than the IRS systems out there? Your hard drives yeah. um, or your cloud or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so you guys, I can guarantee you, I wouldn't say most, but a lot of you in this room have been targeted by a fraudster who's, you know, sitting in their mom's basement in their footy pajamas in, you know, Bulgaria, but they're smart and they're attacking your system and they're trying to steal your tax information. And the folks doing it now, they, they don't care about tax information. They don't know anything about taxes. What they do, they steal it and they sell it. They go into the dark web, they sell it. You know, we, we surveil the dark web. We monitor what's going on in the dark web to the the best we can, we see that stuff out there for sale all the time. Um, I, I want to mention, well, before we go on to the data breaches, just real quick, on the EFIMs and P10s, I, I mentioned this, this earlier, you know, folks using stolen EFINs or, or P10s to, to prepare returns, and then I10s. Um, the, the IRS, that, that's something we're in the process of doing now, is we're trying to do a better job of, of authenticating ITINs um, because we'll, you know, right now, somebody can send in, I don't know, birth certificates from Mexico or something, and, and you know, if, if it looks right, we'll, we'll give them an ITIN. Well, a lot of times they're not right. A lot of times they are, but we, we need to do a better job of authenticating that. But the, the, the big thing here is, is the data breaches. Would you go ahead? Um, I, I, I mentioned the uh, compromised tax professionals. You know that they need the information to mirror the actual returns. The the insidious thing they do is we refer to it as remote access software. How many of you guys access your clients' files remotely? In other words, you're, you have an office with the tax information and you're sitting at home and you want to get the tax information so you access that information through you know, remote access. It, it looks like none of you do that. I'm not sure if I believe that, but, I'm, but if true, I'm glad because that is the number one way of, of these folks uh, compromising your system. Um, that they, they have so many different ways of hacking the remote access. And we, you know, when we're aware of a breach on, on a return preparer, tax professional, CPA, we'll go out and interview the CPA. And, you know, it's, we've heard this a few times. Yeah, I was sitting at my computer one day, I was working on a return, and all of a sudden the cursor started moving. 
And you know, then the next thing I know, the, the return's gone, and, and later that day, they filed that return. And all they did on that return was they changed the routing number on the bank account. It's pretty hard for the IRS to detect that, right? Because it's, it's, it's the return for that taxpayer except going to a different bank account. Um, so moral of the story there is, and I'll keep saying this a few more times, make sure you protect your system. Um, September of 16, like I said, this has really exploded in the last 12, 12 months. We had uh, 15 that reported compromises. Um, I've got some numbers here. I think it's on the next slide, but yeah, Let me go to the next slide. Okay, no, no, this was, th I think this was at least 10 of those ones in September. Um, so, attempted theft of over $8 million in, in a two-week period. Now, what that means is the fraudsters went in, stole the information, filed the returns, and the total attempted fraudulent claims against the government was $8 million, just in a two-week period. And, you know, we're not going to stop a lot of that. We'll stop some of it, but again, it's, it's really... It's really hard to stop that stuff. I, I think I had a result on that. Yeah. Um, now, now those, those are 10 that we kind of became aware of early. So what we recommend is anytime a tax professional knows they've been compromised, please get a hold of the IRS immediately. In irs.gov, there's a whole way of you know, we kind of spell out how to do it. Those YouTube videos I mentioned, it tells you how to do it. Because the quicker you can get us, basically what we're gonna ask for is your clients' names and social numbers. Uh, we may just ask for the social numbers and then we can go in and protect those social numbers. Um, but that will save the government a lot of money. Business email compromises. This is, uh, again, this has kind of gone crazy in the last year. It, it amazes me um, how many folks fall for this, but they do. And it's, it's another, um, you know, we've been going out and talking to a lot of people about this also. So typically somebody in a corporation um, or a company, a small company, usually someone in the payroll department, human resources, they get an email. They get an email from the CEO somebody who's the boss and it says hey um you know we're going through an audit or we're you know we're there's you know this consulting firm they, they need all of our w-2s for this year and um the payroll person will shoot the uh, all the w-2s off to that ceo and that you know it's called social engineering because you know the the fraudsters know the name of the ceo They've changed the email address by like one digit, so the email address they're using looks just like the corporate email address. Uh, so you have to feel sorry for some of these folks who fall for this. But they have shot all the W-2s off to this fraudster. The fraudster immediately, typically sells them on the dark web and they're out there to be used to uh, uh, produce you know, high consistency fraudulent claims. Um, I think this is a little out of date. We have a lot more than 200 victims at this point and a lot more than 350,000 compromised W-2s. Um, I'm, I'm just telling you guys this because, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's not necessarily return preparers, but it's part of the tax ecosystem, as we say. Um, and certainly, if, if you ever get one of those emails, just delete it. Uh, again, it's a numbers game, you know. Only one out of 100 has to work. And they send out thousands. All right, this is similar, payroll web portals. Um, a, a very target, a, a very rich target for them to uh, obtain this information. You know, it, in, in the federal government, 
if I want my W-2, if I want to know something about my payroll, you know, we, we go into a, a website. And, you know, the, the protection is pretty good, I think. But if a fraudster wants to target it, there's a good chance they're going to, you know, I, I, as I'm fond of saying, I'm on my, uh, you know how when you're a victim of a, of a compromise, they do the free credit monitoring? Mm -hmm. I have three free credit monitorings going right now because I've been victimized three times. And one was the OPM, you know, where just about every federal employee in the last 20 years, our, our information is out there. Now, we think it was the Chinese, and we're not really sure what they're doing with that, but they're probably not doing this stuff with it. Um, but, you know, we, I've had other, you know, there, was, a, there was, a, was an IRS laptop stolen. My information was in there, along with thousands of other IRS employees. So, so, so you never know. Uh, when someone's going to have your information and they can use it to get into these web portals. Um, so we're, we're seeing a lot of those. The, the other thefts, um, I'm sure you guys have seen this, these emails or something like them. You, you get an email and it says, um, it looks like it's from the IRS and it'll say, uh, you know, you, you, know you, you need to change your password. Go into e-services right now and change your password. Um, it, it looks, it, the, the email looks pretty real. Now, if you scrutinize it closely, it's not. Because, you know, these, t these folks are typically from Eastern Europe or Asia, and, you know, their English is a little off, uh, their, their grammar and spelling. But um, it works sometimes. The, the, the other one, um, Similar to that is, I don't know if this has happened. Let's say you get an email from TaxSlayer. And TaxSlayer says, hey, uh, you know, to, to get into your, uh, your tax pro system, you need to go in and change the, uh, the, uh, the, the password and user ID. Well, I don't know if TaxSlayer does that. But if they do, you, you better make sure it's from TaxSlayer, because it might not be from TaxSlayer. And I don't think any of you guys want the bad guys getting into your tax layer accounts, right? Um, so we're, we're seeing more and more of that. So I've, you know, hopefully I've scared you guys a little bit about being a return preparer as far as, uh, you know, preparing fraudulent returns. Well, now I'm kind of scaring you about your, your systems and how important it is to, to secure them. Uh, so how do you do that? You know, it, a lot of it's, it's common sense, limit access to data and information. You know, if, if, you use a, uh, if you use a desktop at home to do all your tax work, um, don't let your granddaughter surf the web on it. You know, just keep it separate, only you should use it and you should be careful on what you do with that particular unit. Um, patch operating systems and applications. You know, anytime you get a, 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 a notification for a patch or an update, do it. That's common sense. You know, I, I tell the story I, in my family, you know, I'm an Android guy, my wife's an Apple person. So I, I, I rarely touch her phone, but there's been a couple occasions where I'll, I'll need her phone for something and invariably I go in and there's, there's a notification there for an update from two months ago. And I'm like, what do you, just hit the button. And he's like, well, you know, it, it, you have to turn it off and turn it back on. <laughs> um, so, yeah, don't do that. You know, a lot of people, I, I, I like to think it's not so much true anymore, but some people say, well, you know, I got an antivirus, so I'm set. You know, antivirus is just one part of your defense now. Um, Obviously, you need the, the, the firewalls, um, secure wireless access points and, and networks. For those of you who, those few of you who admitted doing re remote access, would you do it from the hotel Wi-Fi here? No. Would you do it from a Starbucks? No. You need to make sure it's from a secure wire, which most of you, I'm sure, have secure wireless at home or Wi-Fi. Um, 
And of course, the uh, web and e email filters. Hopefully, you've got spam boxes that block a lot of this stuff. Did, did any of y'all go to the tax forums this year? Did you see us talk there? Um, I think I only spoke at one of them, but we, we had somebody give a presentation at every one of those, and it was kind of the whole security system, scared straight presentation. All right. Oh, we're already there. How's my time going? I told you, I'm blowing through this. Okay, um, so I just want to talk about some of these. This just um, kind of emphasizes the importance to CI of getting things publicized, because if we're only going to prosecute three or 400 people a year, we have to make sure as many people know about it as possible. So, okay, so this one was an, these are all pretty recent. We, and, uh, you know, we, see, we, get, we probably do, you know, one or two of these a week. So this was back in September. Where was this? Northern District of Alabama. Um, so after a five-day trial, subject convicted on 13 tax-related counts. Um, she hasn't been sentenced yet. She faces three years in prison. It was refundable credits that her clients were not entitled to. Subject charged the clients up to $3,000 for each return. Now, the only thing I can say there, she must have been getting her clients a crazy <laughs> refund. Um, but, G, do you think the taxpayers knew what was going on? Yeah. Um, so, the, the subject testified during trial that she only included information given to her by the clients. I can't believe she actually got on the stand and said that. Um, however, the government presented evidence that showed Anderson's own personal returns that she prepared herself for 10, 11, and 12 had the exact same false items on them. Plus, I'm sure we brought in, you know, a dozen of her clients who said, hey, well, I don't know what she's talking about. You know, we never even talked about that stuff. I had no idea. Of, I, I never even saw what was on my return. I just signed it because she told me to sign it. Okay, the next one. Okay, this was in a Knoxville... Tennessee, pretty recent, back in September. This guy got um, 41 months in prison, um, preparing false returns, 09 through 013, false Schedule C scheme, defrauded the IRS of more than 1.4 million in tax revenue, and all, he, he was also indicted at the same time on failure to register as a sex offender. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that had something to do with his 41-month sentence. So the, the moral of that story is for those of you who have employees, if you trust someone enough to prepare tax returns that you're responsible for, you better do some sort of background check on them. All right. This is Warwick... Uh, Rhode Island, that's actually the, the POD where I work. Uh, September 2017, uh, this guy was indicted on 44 counts, years 11 through 15, uh, false and inflated deductions for home mortgage interest, false charitable donations, and false inflated cre credits for the home energy updates. Um, now this one's a little different because this, as part of his defense, sort of, he said, oh, I, 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 I'm a victim of a breach, you know? And so he says he was a victim of the breach and these breach returns were the fraudulent ones. Well, that wasn't a good defense because it wasn't true. Um, he had been breached, but it was breached after the investigation even began. Or, or yeah, after the investigation had, had been started. Um, he also, do all of you meet your clients in person? face to face, sit down with the folks. This guy met in person very rarely with his clients. Uh, so he's looking at up to three years. Okay. Planet Houston, 
July 17. This guy pled guilty to filing 37 false returns, uh, cost the government 244,000 in, in, in uh, false claims. I can assure you there were a lot more than that, but those are the ones that he pled guilty to. Um, he had a business called Chester's Mobile Tax Service. Do you guys drive around and do returns? <laughs> Maybe not a bad business model, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah. False un unreimbursed medical and dental expenses, false charitable donations, and false unreimbursed employee expenses. Oh, I've got an update here. October 3rd, he was sentenced to 18 months in jail in order to pay $244,000 in restitution. Okay, Laplace in New Orleans. Um, I, pretty sure we're, a, we're not gonna see the 6.9 million that they owe us. So pled guilty to prank false returns, 700 fraudulent returns for the years 11 through 16. Subject did not, so she was a ghost preparer. She did not include her name on the returns, but more than $6 million in refunds went through her bank account. Um, she, she, owes, she does the owe, owe the IRS almost $7 million. She faces up to uh, 12 years in prison she should, you know, I, I looked for the sentencing. She was supposed to be sentenced on the 15th of November. I couldn't find it. Okay, just a couple more of those. Uh, this is up in New England. I remember I was the, before this job, I was the special agent in charge up there. So I remember when we started this case. A former police sergeant, did, I don't have slides on these because they're too recent. This was November 15th. Former police sergeant sentenced to 48 months and ordered to pay $1 million in restitution. Um, now he got four, one of the reasons he got 48 months is he was also embezzling money from disabled veterans. Okay, I'm there. <laughs> he, uh, he also served as a VA appointed fiduciary for eight disabled vets between 2007 and 2012. Not only did he embezzle money from them, but he actually used the funds straight from their accounts to pay his mortgage. All right. Um, I could tell you more about that case, but I probably shouldn't. But uh, there's some interesting other twists to it. Um, okay, I, I, I want to mention this one because I just want to point out that I do not live in a glass house. Former Fresno IRS employees sentenced to prison for tax fraud. This is not a return prepared case, but I thought I'd better throw this in there to, you know, so. Um, married couple who were longtime employees of IRS sentenced to six months um, confinement. Between 2005 2013, they filed false returns for themselves and others, mostly family members using fraudulent de dependents. Uh, the total loss to the government was $130,000, which, in the world of tax fraud, that's not a real big loss to the government. Um, but these are IRS employees. And I can assure you, they're held to a very high standard. You know, all of us, our returns are audited every year. So our returns have to be perfect. How these people got away with this for eight years is beyond me. But I guess uh, the wheels of justice move slowly sometimes. Okay, the last one I have here, this was back in October. Um, Dallas preparer pleads guilty, had previously pled guilty in 2015, but, did, but failed to appear for his sentencing. I can assure you, federal judges do not like that. Uh, this guy became a fugitive. He was a fugitive for two years. He had businesses in Dallas, Houston, New Orleans, Atlanta, Chicago, and LA, under the name Siam Tax Services and Baby Mama Tax. <laughs> We, we don't make this stuff up. Um, so actually what he was indicted for was uh, 2011 returns. This was, one, this was one year, but he had a lot of locations. 4,226 returns totaling $6 million in refunds. Um, 
he actually had a, an army of recruiters who he would pay 50 bucks for every client they brought in. And actually some of them ended up being indicted along, along with him. I'm not sure exactly what, I don't think it's illegal to, I, I don't know, but anyway, they, they were indicted for some sort of a conspiracy. All right, I think I'm out of uh, pages here, so um, if anybody has any questions, yes, sir. We've, we've got a mic, hold on, we'll, we'll run that over to you. Okay, go ahead, and then if there's any other questions, we'll have a mic on that end, and I'll be walking around with my you can just come up a little closer. You know, 30 years of firearms qualifications, my... Uh... Yeah. These guys are Eastern Bloc Europe over here since the 90s, and you know they're starting to send money to Walmart or whatever. What are you guys doing to, to, to thwart that? So if you got a call like that and someone said you owed money to the IRS and they wanted you to put money on an iTunes card, would you do it? No. Well, people are doing it. And again, it only has to work sometimes. Uh, what are we doing about it in CI? It's not really a CI thing because it's people pretending to be an IRS employee, and there's a whole other division called TIGDA, Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration. They, they had a really big investigation on this, and a year ago, they actually busted a building, an entire building in India with hundreds of employees. And the entire purpose of this organization in India, it may have been the size of tax layer, I don't know, um, was calling the US and threatening people to send money, saying they were with the IRS. Um, so, it's it's still happening, but you know we're uh, that, you know something like that's really because if these folks are in Pakistan, India, Eastern Europe, you know what do we do? Stop phone calls from coming in? Yes, sir. Is there a hotline for folks to call in? Because sometimes it takes a long time to get through to the IRS. If we, I've encountered clients before that felt like they had in, had a uh, bad preparer. Yeah. Uh, so is there a number or something we can give them to call? Because if I mentioned, well, you should call the IRS, they said, oh no, I hadn't got an hour, you know, so. No, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say there is not. When I started, there was. Um, I, as a matter of fact, I've, I've always said we should have a, we should have a number. There should be 1-800-RATFINK. Um, <laughs> But we, we don't. Now, if you go into irs.gov, there is a procedure for reporting fraudulent activity to the IRS. Quite frankly, it's dated and, and inadequate, and we're trying to fix that. You have to send a letter to Fresno or a Form 3949 to Fresno. We're saying, can, can we at least have an email box set up so people can email us information? Or maybe a fax? You know, the, you know even you know, how long have faxes been around now? But. Um, no, unfortunately, we do not have a hotline number, but we, we were, you know, someone would have to man that, because there's going to be a lot of calls, right? And again, that's just a manpower budget budget issue. But there is a procedure in irs.gov, so I guess you could send them, send them there. Well, but I will say, you know, every major city has a CI office. We're typically in the same building with TAC, you know, Taxpayer Assistance, or one of the TAC offices. Um, they can find us there. And our agents do like that information. Yes, sir. Can we officially say that unless we get a letter from you, that what whoever calls us is not from the Internal Revenue? Could you officially say that? You know, that's that's a little tricky. I would say 99 out of 100 times, yes. Uh, we, we're actually coming up with this new form that CI is generating. And it's, it's actually for return prepare investigations. Because when we want to sh go out and talk to a client of, a, of a, what we think is a fraudulent return preparer, uh, we want to call them and set up an appointment. Well, you know, most people now, they get a call from the IRS, they hang up. Can, can you blame them? Well, I usually tell my clients, if you ain't getting a letter, then don't come talk to me about you're, it. You're safe in saying that. 
there, yeah. there's, you know, I think that's probably the safe approach, but, but what I'm saying now is it's becoming so hard for us to do these investigations that we, we will be sending out a letter basically saying something to the effect, we're, we're, we're investigating this matter related to you, you're gonna get a call from an IRS special agent. Hopefully that'll help. Um, but no, I, I think you're safe in saying if, 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 they don't get, if they don't get something in writing first, hang up. Well, there is a commercial that's saying that because so many people owe the IRS, that, that the IRS was hiring people to give them a call. So I think that's why a lot of, a lot of the calls are going around and people are concerned about them. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. I, there, I, is a, there is a commercial and it says that uh, there is a lot of people that owe the IRS and the IRS was hiring people to, to do, I guess, help with collection. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the IRS has been con contracting out some collection work. It's my understanding they don't call either. They send a letter first also. Well, with that, being, with, with that commercial going out, uh, how do the people know whether the call is legit? Well, um, you know, it reminds me of that saying. If, if, if it's on the internet, it must be true. Well, if it's on TV, is it true? Um, this, this sounds like maybe an FCC matter. Okay, my question is, there is a um, city to where there's a lot of um, clients that go to get their taxes prepared mm -hmm. to where they know they're not supposed to get $10,000 for a refund, yep. and they're going to these people that prepare it, and they know they charge the two or $3,000 that you've spoken of, when is the IRS also gonna make it fall back on the client as well to take responsibility if they've never gotten that much and then they're putting school or everything else on there. So what accountability does the person have as well as the preparer? Um, well, you know, e even in your situation, let's say there's a two to $3,000 loss for which we all think that client that taxpayer is partially responsible for. Department of Justice, who prosecutes our cases, they want nothing to do with that. They don't want to take that to trial. They do not want to lose. It's not a big case. Now, who owes that money back to the IRS, the preparer or the taxpayer? The taxpayer, with interest, with penalties. So they're going to be in a world of hurt from that perspective. And we, you know, we do have you know, that's something that's a high priority for this, re reclaiming that, that money in part of a fraudulent scheme. Uh, but like I explained earlier, you know, our resources are so limited, we have to go after the person who we feel is primarily responsible for that scheme, the return preparer. Okay, I have two statements. Um, one is in reference to the letter. A lot of times you can't believe the letters because in my office I had two people to receive a letter and one was my daughter. And uh, she got very upset because she says, uh, Mom, the letter saying that I owe the IRS. She said, why did I get a refund for 400 and some dollars? I'm like, you don't owe the IRS. I've been doing your taxes for years. You do not owe. I said, don't worry about that. It's just a fraudulent letter. She gets scared, so she go on the website, you know, check where's my refund, mm -hmm. you know, to see whether or not she was really due that money and whatever for. I can check into it. I'm on the way back from vacation in Florida. She calls me back and said, guess what? It got on there that I'm gonna get 400 and some refund. I said, don't worry about it. I told you it was fraudulent anyway, and I was gonna check on it. She said, well, I ain't never paid. I don't wanna pay. She don't have any kids. She don't get much back, but it was hers what she did get back. Mm -hmm. That's my first statement now. The uh, uh, second statement, now I know you talk mostly about the uh, tax, only about the tax repairs, the fraudulent stuff, yep. but what about the uh, um, tax payers? Example, I have a client that I'm working with right now. She claimed her grandkids, she have legal custody from the court <coughs> to claim the grandkids, excuse me, kind of cold a little bit, but anyway, um, she also have letters from the church pastor, from the health care facilities and all that, stating that these kids are with her, even from the landlord. They've been with her for years, but now you know how it works. The mother, she don't have custody anymore, but she sneaks or sell the kids for someone else to claim the kids, okay? Mm -hmm. Either she on a welfare system. This is a case, something like that. 
this customer of mine, we done sent lots of information to the Internal Revenue Service to prove that the kids are with her. They are not doing anything about it. I suggest that we're in South Carolina, that she go to Columbia, South Carolina, talk to them. We call them first. They say, well, Augusta, Georgia is closer. She can go over there, take the papers there. So she did that, and so they took all the information. How about a month later, she gets another letter still being denied, saying she got the CNN proof. She done did it twice. Why do she have to keep sending in that? She sign in. A uh, lot of proof from the landlord who all stayed out school records, okay, health care well, records, uh, let, let me, let, let me, let me, let me cut you off there. The, 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 the I mean, it just frustrates me because it's getting I, on my nerves. The, the, the second part of your <laughs> issue, it, it sounds like it's, it, it could be partially fraudulent, but CI is not really in the business of providing taxpayer service. I, you know, all of those issues you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Is, is really something that should be resolved by the civil functions of IRS. Um, well, that's what I'm asking for we, advice. We Who should she talk to? Because when she called a the number, they said the same thing. Well, ma'am, you got to just send in the information, the documents, blah, blah, right. blah. But she's sending in the documents. Has she um, ever gone into a tax? Excuse me? Has she ever gone into an IRS office with all this stuff? Yes, I remember I just said she went to Augusta. They told her to go okay. to Augusta. Uh, internal Revenue Service since she was closer than Columbia because I was thinking that she should go to Columbia, South Carolina since she's in South Carolina, but they told her she can come to Augusta Internal Revenue Service. They took all the information, made copies and everything. I don't know what they and, did and with it. still not resolved? No. And she don't know what to do. She called me the other day, and I don't know what to do either. <laughs> <laughs> so well, that's why I was asking your advice. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, that's just not my side of the house. <laughs> well, that's what, I'm, that's what I was asking. I wasn't sure, you know, they used to always say, I thought it was a dumb answer, but only one dumb answer is a question you don't ask for, so. Okay. <laughs> we got a question right here. Um, yes, I'm not sure if this is related to you or not, but I know recently we had, um, they're not our clients, but they wanted to become our clients. They're Latino customers. And so they live in a Latino community in Mississippi. And they say, well, we want to come to you because when Trump came in office this year, it's like 200 of us that stay in this Latino community, all of us was denied our refund. Is that true? How does, I mean, how is that working? I mean, because I know that Trump has been, you know, saying a lot about the Latinos and he want to deport them and things of that nature. And I was like, I don't know if that's something that we as regular taxpayers can help them with, that none of their people received their tax returns this year. They were all held up or? I, I've heard nothing. Right. I've never heard anything about yeah. that. I, I find that story a little beyond believable. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the president doesn't get down in the weeds with, with uh, taxpayers. And all right, I think we got time for about two more questions. Okay. Two more. So I've got I've got one more. Um, I, I've been under criminal investigation investigation twice. Um, first one I had a client hadn't filed since 1985. Okay, bought him up to date. This guy was a long haul trucker. I mean, he had receipts that would fill half that corner over there. We did the return. He started out owing four hundred seventy thousand dollars. When we got finished, he owed forty three hundred. Charlotte called me up and came and visited me in, in Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, wanted to put me under lockdown, all that stuff. We bought all the uh, receipts back. They reviewed it, um, went through eight months of investigation, came up with a zero change. That's a big plus. Yep. Um, second one was I had a client that has like a few trucks. We took the reefer credit. San Francisco called me up. I think it was uh, Northern, Northern California, 831 night. I thought it was a fraudulent call. She said, sir, we got a problem. What are you doing giving this guy additional money based on his income? I said, we give him credit for reefer, which I wasn't thinking. If anybody knows the trucker world, reefer means refrigerated fuel. The refrigerator, well, the auditor, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for out. clarifying the, that. You know. <laughs> but, but the thing I'm saying is the, 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 uh, the investigator, you know, couldn't pull that out, even though her, her mother is a long haul trucker out of Utah. So she understood once I, once I bought it across and she pulled the records and, and we still had another no change situation. Um, last year I had a, an investigator that the fellow that hadn't filed since 85, we pushed it to e-file the last three years 
till the 17th of April. This auditor in Richmond did not know the deadline was the 17th. She pretty much cursed me out, and then about three hours later, she called me back, and she says, I apologize. I didn't know it was a deadline. I said, you're the revenue agent. <laughs> you're sitting there making the laws, and you're not understanding what you're doing. My question would be, sometimes they need a little bit more training in those areas, and, and probably perk your guys, make sure they know what's happening before they jump on us. Thank you. I, I, I would agree. Um, the, the, the first one, I, I will simply say this. I, I can assure you, we, because of our limited resources, we do not initiate criminal investigations cavalierly. Uh, usually we've done months of work. We're pretty sure there's something there. Do we make mistakes? Do things not pan out sometimes? Do we have to discontinue investigations with nothing happening? All the time, all the time. Uh, but I just want you to know we don't, based upon you know, one, you know, one 1099 that didn't get on a tax return, we don't initiate a criminal investigation on that. Okay, uh, well I think we have to stop here. I'll be hanging around for a little while if anybody has any uh, off, the, off the record questions for me. All right, All right guys, let's thank give you. Mr. Offer a big round of applause.